You are listening to We Saw the Devil, an investigative and conversational true crime podcast that deep dives into fascinating criminal cases that are solved, unsolved, or ongoing. From America's Lori Vallow to Jeremy's Armin Mivas, we examine and discuss the world's most shocking cases. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to follow us online. Check us out at WeSawTheDevil.com and we saw the Devil on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can become part of the show by backing us on Patreon. Hello, everyone. You are listening to We Saw the Devil. This is Robin, and I am back. I am alive. Thank you so much for your patience, guys. I decided to take a little bit of a break from the podcast, unexpected. Every once in a while, you you know, you need to participate in some self-care. And that's what I've done for the last couple of weeks. I just really needed a break. So thank you for your check-ins and messages, but I am back. So much has gone on in the news over the last few weeks, and there's so much to talk about. But this case in this episode is one that I've actually wanted to cover for quite a while. Never in a million years did I expect movement in this case. This case is from 70 years ago, and suddenly we're finding it back in the news, which I'll discuss later on in the episode and and what reason and why it's back in the news, but it is absolutely one of the biggest stains on American history and also an incredibly important moment in American history, particularly when dealing with the civil rights movement. This episode is going to be the story, the full story, of Emmett Till. What I found very, very, very interesting is that, you know, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. I learned all about the civil rights movement, a lot of the important places such as Memphis, Birmingham. A lot of these locations are here in the southern region, here in my area. Throughout my life, I've spoken to friends from California, New England, and many of them aren't aware of the story of Emmett Till. I also find that the younger generations, too, a a lot of times have heard the name but not really aware of the importance of it or what happened. So considering that this case has found itself back in the news cycle in the last couple weeks, I really, really, really wanted to cover it. This is a case that's horrified me since I was a small child, and it still just fills me with a rage that I cannot even cannot even contain. So before we get into it, let's just get some really quick housekeeping out of the way. You're listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. You can find us at wesawthedevil.com. From there, you can find all of our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. You can shoot us a message if you have a case request. You can find our Patreon if you're interested in financially backing the show and basically everything about us. Everything is kind of currently under construction, so please bear with us. Also, you can find merch via our store there as well if you're looking to rep a t-shirt or some sort of swag. Beyond that, if you're liking the show, digging it, please take 10 seconds out of your day to leave a five-star review. It means the absolute world to us and lets us know that you're enjoying what we do. And at the risk of sounding like a complete asshole, I'm going to go ahead and say it. There's a sincere issue in the world of true crime, especially on the podcast front, guys. Anytime... I post any sort of news article, infographic, anything like that on social media. It never fails that someone makes a shitty comment. Last year, I posted an article on Facebook about the Wrightsville fire of 1959. On that night, 21 African-American boys burned to death in the dormitory of an Arkansas reform school. The fire was started. These boys were, in fact, murdered. The post was an anniversary post, a, a just a historical post saying this many years ago today. And a whole handful of middle-aged women were posting, why are you race baiting? Why are you bringing this up? Why are you, why are you bringing this up in such a politically charged climate? Why are you trying to be divisive? Let's just hold and think about that for a moment. No one bats an eye or questions when a pretty white girl is discussed, whether she was murdered by a husband, boyfriend, lured into a cult, whatever. You know, the missing white woman syndrome that especially that uh, was discussed during the Gabby Petito case. No one cares. No one bats an eye. Do you think that post would have received the same reply if I posted something? Black Dahlia murder, Sharon Tate, anything like that? No. And this is a real statistic. And you can ask anyone you know, 
who's a podcaster. Episodes that typically cover people of color do not perform at the rate as those who discuss white women. That's just a fact. That is a fact that every single podcaster who does this is aware of. And it's horrendous. And I've been thinking about this comment that this woman, who is a listener of this podcast, that she made on the Wrightsville Fire post that I made last year. It made me so angry. I talked about it for weeks just because I can't believe that people lack self-awareness to such a degree. It's absolutely sickening to me. And if you're one of those listeners sitting here saying, why are you doing this? Why are you contributing to the div- divisiveness in this country? Or my, my all-time favorite, which people usually say is, slavery was so long ago. That's, that will send me into a blind rage. Segregation lasted 89 years from 1866 to 1954. In the 1960s, we saw the heart of the civil rights movement. And here we are in 2022. From an overhead view, post-segregation America has not been that long when you're taking into account American history. We have not been in the post-segregation phase very long considering. I think we all remember that iconic photograph. Even if you don't know what happened, you've heard the name Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was just six years old when she was the first student to desegregate a school in Louisiana, an elementary school. She was flanked by the National Guard, and there was a mob outside. This tiny, tiny little girl was walking through a mob who was screaming at her, shouting at her, pointing at her, calling her the N-word. Just so much hatred. So much hatred. Well, Ruby Bridges is just 67 years old today. 67 years old. Younger than most of your grandparents. We still have people alive today who were tortured, beaten, maimed, shot by white supremacists in the South when they lived in the Jim Crow South. We still have people alive who were there, who witnessed it, who saw it all firsthand. I think sometimes it's really, really hard to timeline history, to realize where we are in relation to other events in history. Anne Frank, had she not been murdered in the Holocaust, would be 93 years old today. It's really easy when the tide of public opinion changes so rapidly these days in the modern day, just how close we are to certain historical events. We want to believe that all of these things happened so long ago, but they didn't. World War II ended 77 years ago this year, so just 77 years ago. There are World War II veterans still alive, Holocaust survivors still alive. They just arrested two people. But in particular, a gentleman uh, who was accused of being a Nazi, who working, you know, Nazi officer working in a concentration camp. So this this happened so long ago. Why are you talking about it? Doesn't really fly. And if you are one of these people, I implore you to search deeply inside yourself and ask yourself why you're made so uncomfortable by discussing historical events that actually happened. Because I have a feeling you're probably going to be a little bit ashamed. And with that, let's just go ahead and get into the episode. Mamie Carthen was born to John and Alma Carthen in a small rural town near Webb, Mississippi on November 23rd, 1921. When Mamie was two years old, John and Alma decided to go north in order to escape the racial violence and harsh segregation laws that prevented them from economic opportunities. This movement at large was called the Great Migration. From about 1916 all the way through 1970, roughly 6 million African Americans left the rural South, moving to cities in the North, Midwest, and West. You see, after the Civil War, on December 18, 1865, the 13th Amendment was adopted as part of the United States Constitution. This amendment abolished slavery and involuntary servitude. The 13th Amendment freed roughly 4 million slaves, but most of them actually still remained dependent, taking on obscene labor contracts and finding themselves once again working in fields under inhumane conditions. The South, pissed off that owning Black people was no longer legal, decided to adopt its own local and state laws. Right after the war, these became known as Black Codes. The laws detailed where they could live, where they could work, 
how, where, and when they could travel, how much they could get paid. The Black Codes just basically modernized their oppression and circumvented federal laws. After the war, when all of the soldiers from both sides returned home, Confederate soldiers came home and they became lawyers, police officers, judges, farmers. They were tasked with enforcing these Black Codes. Should a Black citizen find themselves breaking one of these codes or their labor contract, they would potentially end up in prison, oftentimes with much longer sentences than their white peers. There were multiple options for punishment there. The state either leased the prisoners to private businesses and forced them into contracts that exchanged a period of servitude for the payment of a criminal fine, or they placed them on state or county chain gangs. During this period, a very large proportion of the Black population in the South became incarcerated. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 required Southern states to ratify the 14th Amendment, which granted equal protection of the Constitution to former slaves. It granted citizenship to persons born and naturalized in the United States. Coming in hot three years later in 1870 was, you guessed it, the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed that a male citizen's right to vote would not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And the South didn't like that very much. The KKK had officially dissolved in 1869, but in reality, it just went underground, stronger than ever. There were beatings, murders, lynchings, cross burnings, and mass initiatives for intimidation. It was a literal hellscape for rural African Americans in the American South. Now, let's fast forward to where we were. 1916 with the Great Migration. As I said, the Great Migration was a 54-year period where roughly 6 million African Americans left the rural South, you know, moving to cities in the North, Midwest, and West. This was due to a mass labor shortage in 1914 when World War I kicked off. Many of them took a factory job in urban centers, which paid up to four times as much in wages as they would have made farming in the South. After World War I kicked off, they had a lot of openings. So a lot of Black people started migrating all over the country to take over some of these factory positions to make money. And word of mouth traveled quickly, even in the early 1900s. Hey, you can make better money here, and it's much safer for you here. It's estimated that by the end of 1919, more than 1 million Black people had left the South in favor of the opportunities in other regions. They traveled by boat, bus, train, cars, and even horse-drawn carts to leave the South. And this also caused population booms in other cities. New York's population rose by 66%. Philadelphia, 500%. Detroit, 611%. And Chicago, 158% increase in population. And we're going to pick up this case in Chicago in 1924. Mamie Carthen was just two years old when she, her brother, and her mother arrived in Argo, Illinois, a small suburb of Chicago. Her father had departed Mississippi and arrived a few months earlier. He had gotten a job at the Argo Corn Products Refining Company and wanted to make sure that it worked out before sending back home for his young family. Argo was a small, predominantly black neighborhood that was growing at breakneck speed. Between 1915 and 1940 alone, more than half a million Southern African Americans moved to Chicago. The Carthens called their neighborhood Little Mississippi. It was tight and close-knit, and they would help recent arrivals get jobs or even a place to stay until they got on their feet. They were one of the only homes in the neighborhood to have a telephone, and they would leave a key under their doormat in case someone from the neighborhood needed to make a phone call. If they did, they would leave a nickel, use the key, go inside, make the call, and then leave. When Mamie was 12 years old, the family decided to take a trip to visit family and friends back in Mississippi. When Mamie arrived at her grandparents' house, she couldn't understand the conditions in which they were living. Chicago wasn't the most luxurious, but the housing in rural Mississippi was near squalor. But most of all, she couldn't understand why her grandparents were using a Sears Roebuck catalog as toilet paper. She wondered if they were too poor to afford any. So she decided to perform an act of kindness and stop into the local drugstore to buy them some. 
Mimi grabbed a couple rolls of toilet paper from the shelves and went to place it on the drugstore checkout counter. The owner flatly refused to sell it to her. He snarled and said, go use corn cobs like all the rest. Mimi felt shock, anger, and embarrassment well up inside of her. And just when she was about to speak, her grandfather walked in and pulled her out. She wrote about this experience in her autobiography, saying, He pounded the fear of every black person in the state of Mississippi into me. In Mississippi, there were certain things that black people were denied by white people. The freedom of movement, the luxury of choice, and a roll of toilet paper. It was Mamie's first experience with targeted hatred and bigotry, far outside the cozy streets of Little Mississippi and Argo, Illinois. It made her appreciate the freedom and community that she had back in Chicago, and she never forgot how she felt in that moment. In 1934, Mamie's parents divorced, leaving her absolutely gutted. She threw herself into her schoolwork, and Mamie Carthen became not only the fourth Black student to graduate from that high school, but the first Black student to make the honor roll. Most of the girls at her age at that school dropped out at the age of 16 to marry. Shortly after graduating high school, at age 18, she met a man by the name of Lewis Till. Lewis had just recently moved to the area for Missouri to work in the Argo Corn Company, just like Mamie's father. Lewis was very attractive, suave, and spent his non-work hours as an amateur boxer. Many women from Argo, Illinois, had a thing for him. However, after the first time Lewis saw Mamie, he only had eyes for her. Mamie's parents didn't really approve as they thought that he was too much of a playboy. One day, he asked Mamie out on a date. They went to the Berg's Rexall drugstore in Summit, Illinois, which at the time was racially segregated. They got their ice creams, but instead of eating it outside where they were supposed to sit, Lewis Till stood up to the drugstore owner. He told him that they were not going to sit outside in the, quote, black area. They are going to sit right inside and eat their ice cream and the drugstore owner allowed it. Other black locals walking by saw them sitting inside through the window and went inside themselves. They too got ice cream and sat inside to eat it. So for Mamie Carthen and Lewis Till's first date, they integrated a drugstore. Mamie and Lewis fell in love quickly and got married shortly thereafter in October of 1940. On Friday, July 25th, 1941, Emmett Lewis Till was born in Chicago's Cook County Hospital. A family friend had given Mamie's baby bump the name of Bobo, and that name would stick around for the rest of Emmett's life. It's also worth noting that in the same year, 1941, sociologist Gunnar Myrtle published a study called An American Dilemma. Myrtle and his researchers asked white Southerners to describe what they believed Black people wanted from integration. The number one answer was intermarriage and sexual intercourse with white women. Just as a little marker for you of public sentiment in that time. What should have been a happy moment for the young couple turned into a living nightmare for Mamie. Lewis Till was not a nice man. Mamie, years later, would describe Lewis as violent and abusive. He would frequently commit spousal rape upon Mamie and the physical abuse nearly ended in her death multiple times. In one particularly severe instance, Mamie confronted Lewis about his being unfaithful. Lewis ended up almost choking Mamie to death, and she survived only because she was in the kitchen near a pot of hot water on the stove. So she grabbed it and poured it on him, and he had no choice but to let her go. Lewis Till had no interest in being a father, and no interest in being a faithful husband either. After another horrific instance of abuse, Mamie had had enough. She mustered the courage to call police and ended up filing a restraining order against Lewis. In 1943, Lewis actually violated that restraining order and was sent to jail. At his trial, he was given the option of going to prison or joining the army. Lewis decided to go into the army in lieu of jail. Free at last, Mamie moved back in with her mother. Her father had passed at this time, so it was just the three of them and a 10-year-old cousin named Thelma. And then, of course, all of the friends, families, neighbors, and, and travelers who passed through there after journeying north from the south. Louis Till was stationed in Italy in the army, and had arranged for back pay to be sent to his family in the United States. 
If anything, he ensured that they had food on the table and their basic needs met. But by July of 1948, the payments suddenly stopped. Shortly thereafter, a letter arrived at Mamie and Alma Carthen's house in Argo. Inside the envelope was a death notice from the War Department informing her, without a full explanation, that her husband Louis had been killed during army service in Italy. Louis Till was dead. Also included in that letter was a silver ring etched with his initials, LT, a ring that he had worn since the day that Mamie had met him. Mamie put it in her jewelry box for safekeeping. Emmett Till grew up surrounded by a constant crowd of cousins and friends. He was feisty, well-mannered, intelligent, and had a wonderful sense of humor. He excelled in math, art, science, and English, but particularly spelling. Several of his family members would go on to call him a prankster, saying that he loved to play jokes but always understood where the line was drawn. Most of all, he was closest to his mother, Mamie. Even by 1954, at age 13, she still called him Bobo. Mamie got a job at a local office as a secretary and worked very long hours. At that point, they lived alone together in a small house that Mamie had purchased on her meager salary, and Emmett would help take care of the house. He would clean, make dinner, do laundry, and was happy to help out his mom. Also in 1954, the Supreme Court ordered that public schools desegregate via their ruling in Brown v. Board of Education. One of the most important SCOTUS decisions in the history of the court, they overturned the separate but equal doctrine, which dated back to the 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson. This led to absolute chaos in the South, with violence against Black citizens reaching in at that point an all-time high. That Christmas, Christmas of 1955, Mamie gave Emmett a brand new suit for Christmas. Little did they know they would pose for their final family portrait shortly thereafter. On May 7, 1955, Reverend George Lee, a grocery store owner and head of the Belzoni, Mississippi NAACP, was shot and killed while driving in his car after trying to vote earlier that day. Just before midnight, a convertible with its top down pulled up beside Lee and an unknown person fired three shotgun blasts into Lee's car. He was struck in the jaw and head and drove off the road where he crashed and then died before he could reach a hospital. There was an autopsy performed, and that autopsy extracted lead pellets from Lee's face that were consistent with buckshot used in a shotgun. The sheriff demanded for the case to be closed. He called it a, quote, traffic accident. He claimed that the pellets were actually dental fillings torn loose by the impact of the crash. He said there was no shooting. That was a lie. Regardless, no one was ever arrested in his murder and the case was never investigated, even though Reverend Lee had been receiving and threatening notes and messages regarding his involvement in voter registration drives. Rosebud Lee, George's widow, decided to have an open casket funeral to show the world the cruelty of white supremacists in the South. This decision is a very relevant detail in relation to the case of Emmett Till. Just a couple weeks later, in August of 1955, in Brookhaven, Mississippi, Lamar Smith, another black man, was shot and killed in front of the county courthouse, in broad daylight, in front of multiple witnesses. And like George Lee, he had also just voted. Much like Reverend George Lee, Lamar Smith was heavily involved in getting the black citizens of Brookhaven, Mississippi, to vote. And he was constantly threatened and sent death threats. In front of 30 white witnesses in broad daylight, yes, 30 white witnesses in broad daylight, Noah Smith walked right up to Lamar Smith and at point blank range shot him in cold blood. Brookhaven Sheriff Robert Case actually allowed Noah Smith to leave the crime scene even though he was covered in Lamar's blood. Just a couple days later, Noah Smith, Max Smith, and Charles Falvey were arrested for Lamar Smith's murder. A couple months later, in September of 1955, a grand jury composed of 20 white men declined to indict the three men for murder after the witnesses failed to come forward to testify. So those three men, including Noah Smith, who committed an act of murder in broad daylight, walked free. And no one has ever been punished for Lamar Smith's murder. This is shocking to hear in 2022. But this was the reality for many Black Southerners of the 1950s. 
Moses Wright, Emmett Till's great uncle, lived in Money, Mississippi with his wife Elizabeth. In 1955, they traveled to Chicago for a funeral and stopped in to see Mamie, Emmett, and other family members. They discussed how great it would be for Emmett to meet his other family down in Mississippi and have him home for the summer for a couple weeks to visit and assist in picking the season's cotton harvest. Wheeler Parker, one of Emmett's cousins, decided to return with Moe's back to Mississippi, with Emmett following soon behind. Mamie was terrified for her 14-year-old son. Emmett didn't grow up in the South and realized just how dangerous it could be for people with their skin color. He only knew Chicago. In her autobiography, Mamie would describe how she tried to explain Southern race relations to Emmett, but he simply just could not understand how serious it was. She told him that he would have to reply to white people with yes ma'am and no sir, to never make eye contact, to step off the sidewalk if a white person was walking towards you on your side, to never talk back, and try not to engage as much as possible. Mamie wrote in her book, quote, How do you give a crash course in hatred? to a boy who has only known love. On August 20th, 1955, Mamie Till took Emmett to the 63rd Street Station in Chicago to catch the southbound train to Money, Mississippi. Emmett was to go visit his great uncle and hang out with his cousins. As he was getting ready to leave, Mamie gave Emmett the engraved ring that his father had worn, the same ring the U.S. Army had sent back to her along with his death notice. Emmett took it excitedly, really proud to show it off to his cousins once he arrived in Mississippi. Emmett arrived in money the very next day. Since it was the beginning of the cotton harvest, Emmett, Wheeler, and their other cousins would help with picking cotton during the day, they would get paid in some change, and then go into town and buy some snacks. This was a near daily occurrence. Three days after Emmett's arrival, he and seven of his friends went into money to Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market a local grocery store whose primary clientele was the local black sharecroppers and their children. The store was owned by 24-year-old Roy Bryant and his 21-year-old wife, Carolyn Bryant. Roy was out of town at the time, and Carolyn was there by herself with her sister in the back. Emmett and his friends wanted to get snacks after picking cotton in the hot sun during the day. Some of the teens went across the street to engage in a game of checkers with people that they knew. Others waited outside the store for Emmett to get his bubble gum. Emmett walked up to the counter and asked for 10 cents of bubblegum and put the money directly into Carolyn Bryant's hand, accidentally touching her as he dropped the money. She recoiled her hand in disgust and pulled it back. Emmett took his gum and then walked out, joining his friends who were sitting outside. Shortly thereafter, Carolyn Bryant came out of the store and started walking towards her car. As she was walking by, Emmett Till whistled. Carolyn began to retrieve a pistol, and the boys saw her do this. They ran across the street to tell Emmett's cousin, Curtis James, what had happened. An older black man was also there with them and urged them to leave the area immediately, fearing that there would be a violent retaliation. After Emmett whistled, all of the teens realized just how serious the situation had just become. The reaction, in turn, made Emmett realize that he had just made a very grave mistake. The teens jumped into their car and sped off towards their home when they saw a car approaching them rapidly from behind. They gained speed, pulled over on the side of the road next to a cotton field, and then got out and ran into the fields, trying to hide from whoever they thought had been chasing them. The car ended up driving by without stopping, and the boys cautiously went back to their car. Emmett begged the group not to tell his grandfather what had happened, and they were true to their word. They didn't. But the secrecy did not last long. Carolyn Bryant, the white store clerk who Emmett Till had whistled at, had been stirring up the town, telling her friends and family that Emmett had not only whistled at her, but also grabbed her. Carolyn's husband, Roy, remained out of town for three days after the grocery interaction. Upon his return, Carolyn did not tell him what had happened. Roy found out about his wife's interactions with Emmett Till from another townsperson who had heard the gossip and decided that he needed to know. One of Moses Wright's neighbors, Rutha May Crawford, told Emmett and his cousins that they had not heard the last from the Bryants. One of her friends who lived in town had heard talk that Roy Bryant, Carolyn's husband, had just returned home and had been openly discussing how they were going to, quote, get that boy from Chicago. 
After hearing that, concerned family members told Moses Wright exactly what had transpired at that grocery store and begged and pleaded with him to put Emmett Till on that night's train back to Chicago. Moses, believing the situation had been blown out of proportion, did not rush or send Emmett home to Chicago on that next train. And what happened later that very evening is one that would change American history forever. And this is where we're going to stop on today's episode. In the next episode, we are going to cover the heinous murder and torture of Emmett Till, 14 years old. I'm going to play audio from his great uncle, Moses Wright, in his own words just a few days after it happened. We're going to go over the trial, or shall I say farce, and then also discuss here in July of 2022. And here's the thing, guys. Carolyn Bryant is still alive. She lives in Durham, North Carolina, and we're going to cover why Carolyn Bryant is in the news again here shortly. But I want all of you, as we go into the next episode coming in just a couple days, I want you to remember that in the back of your mind, that this woman is still alive. But that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. You're listening to We Saw the Devil. I'm Robin. Thank you so much for being so patient through the break. Got a nice little vacation that I needed. And yeah, we are back and back in business. Until next crime.